Welcome. Welcome back to our returning attendees and a warm welcome to all our first time attendees. We're certainly glad to have you all join us today. I'm pleased to open the fourth panel dialogue of this five part series titled Unsettled Ethical Issues in Gene Drive Research. My name is Rafiq Elias and I'm the program manager at McMaster University's Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation, also known as IAPI. This series produced through the Gene Drive Research Forum is the product of partnership between IAP and the FNI Gene Convene Global Collaborative. Through this panel discussion series, we intend to explore burning ethical concerns related to research, testing, and implementation of gene drive technologies for applications to improve public health, to preserve biodiversity, and to address food security concerns. Before I introduce to the session, I'd just like to remind everyone that if you're unable to stay with us for the entire duration, this and the previous sessions are publicly available and can be viewed on the Gene Convene YouTube channel. So in this fourth session, we will discuss from principles to principled action, what ethical principles ought to govern gene drive research. Today's session is moderated by Ms. Catherine Lutberg from the World Health Organization where she is the co-lead of the Global Health Ethics and Governance Unit. She is passionate about embedding ethics more effectively in global health decision-making, promoting better governance in global health and global health research, and strengthening ethics capacity around the globe. Ms. Littler is focused on supporting the realization of the potential benefits of emerging technologies in different settings, and previously co-led the global policy team at the Wellcome Trust. She has been involved in international partnerships and has sat on many oversight bodies, including the PAG Ebola Governance Group, the IDDO Ebola Platform Steering Committee, the H3 Africa Ethics and Regulatory Working Group, and served as the chair of the GLOPID R Data Sharing Work Group. Uh, frankly, I anticipate this to be a very lively session, so let's buckle up. Ms. Littler, please take it away. Rafik, thank you very much for the warm um, introduction and a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, I think we're going to have an we've got an excellent panel today. Um, like the previous um, sessions, for those of you who have attended, we will hear from each of our four panelists one after the other. Um, given their diverse backgrounds and expertise, I think they'll raise many issues in relation to principles. Um, hopefully by the end of it, you'll all have a clear grasp on what principles are and the value for principles in this particular area. I have to lay my cards on the table as the uh, moderator um, that I'm a firm believer um, that principles can be an effective tool for ethical governance and that they do have a role to play, particularly in emerging technologies like I would say human genome editing, which I've been working on for the last two and a half years and gene drive technologies, especially when you are looking at this balance between potential benefits and sometimes obviously also potential harms of unintended consequences or misuse of these type of technologies. So I think it's a really exciting discussion to get into what those principles could be, how we use them. I think that's the really challenging thing with principles going forward is it's one to develop them and even that has its challenges we'll hear today but how do you embed them in practice and policy so really make them meaningful and add that value um, i think that we're not starting from scratch in terms of principles and gene drives we know that there's ongoing work looking at it the who produced guidance on vector-borne diseases more broadly and that identified um, a number of principles that are relevant for gene drive research um, including engagement and social re responsibility issues of global justice we also have principles that have come from funders and sponsors who've entered into this space um, they're looking at a number of different issues again one more around the um, scientific stewardship issues around safety and good governance around transparency and accountability and around engagement and capacity building. So I'm hoping we'll unpack some of those. 
I think there's also recently just published this year um, a code of ethics for gene drive, a proposed code of ethics, which really is the beginning and talks about building that into an international framework for the governance. And that centers on three core values. So scientific responsibility, ecological stewardship and public engagement and benefit sharing. So we've already seen we've got a plethora or a mix of principles. And I think we'll even pick up on others that are um, have been brought up in discussions, including the precautionary principle. So we'll pick up on those in that in this discussion today. Um, so we're going to hear from, as I said, each in, in each speaker, I will introduce them individually. We will then have a discussion amongst the speakers and I encourage all of you um, to post your questions into the chat because we would like to finish with at least half an hour to hear, to have a Q&A with you as the audience and bring up some of the issues um, in relation to how do we um, embed um, principles and effective governance of gene drive research. So with that, I'm going to go to our first speaker, who is um, Alta Charo, and Alta is Professor Emerita of Law and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin. She is an ethics and policy consultant to a number of companies and NGOs is a member of the National Academy of Medicines, where she co-chaired its Committee on Human Genome Editing Governance and its Committee on Emerging Science and Technology Innovation. As well as that, she has also uh, served on committees for a number of US government agencies, including serving on the President Clinton's National Bioethics Advisory Commission, served as a reviewer for the 2016 NAS report, Gene Drives on the Horizon, which I think brings out some of these key issues in relation to principles, and is a serving member of the leader advisory team for DARPA's Safe Genes Project. She was also a member of the World Health Organization's Expert Advisory Committee on Human Applications of Genome Editing. Over to you, Alta, please. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. I think listening to that, I realize I want too many committees. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, thanks very much. And it's a really uh, wonderful opportunity, especially to hear from the others on this panel um, to discuss something I think has been embedded in these conversations, but maybe not drawn out completely. Gene drives, as everybody here knows, are things that are going to transcend political boundaries. It's going to transcend municipal, state, and international borders. It's going to transcend single communities and in fact uh, affect multiple communities, uh, whether they're defined politically, ethnically, racially, linguistically, or whatever. So one of the things that comes up frequently in these discussions is something that Catherine actually referenced, and that is the notion of community engagement. So I wanted to take a few moments to just set the stage on some of the things that need to be refined in that conversation uh, if we're going to move to something that sets up principles uh, for a, a global approach to this, this field. You know, community engagement is something that is used in different ways by different people. For some, it's about simply educating the community. It's a unilateral direction from those who know to those who presumably don't know. For others, it's more of a bi-directional process. You're developing ideas and uh, theories from some of the information coming from the community, you're feeding back to the community your own thinking. And yet others are actually using it to suggest that the community engagement is a form of community empowerment, that there is some kind of role for the community in the decision making process. So one of the first things in the area of gene drive that probably needs to be clarified is whether we're talking about community engagement of some sort or actual empowerment with decision-making authority in any version. That really does raise a very different kind of set of issues around the role of community in setting policy in areas of high technical complexity. Um, so for example, uh, there is a discussion going on in the literature now about free and prior informed consent by communities uh, in, in, you see this in international instruments like the Convention on Biodiversity, the idea being particularly for indigenous communities that before any project starts that might involve them, there needs to be first an engagement that is uh, bi-directional and that takes place before the project begins, in fact, takes place early enough to affect the project's design. Uh, and implicit in this is that the community, however defined, and that's a separate issue, gets to say yay or nay. 
on whether or not the project can proceed. That's an incredible power to have. And that kind of power does raise the question of who it is that is giving consent and on whose behalf. We, we know that there are systems of governance that involve pure majoritarianism. And in those systems of governance, you can argue that the popular will has its way. And so if the popular will is that, for example, a gene drive should not be used in a particular area to get rid of an insect vector for a disease, uh, that therefore it simply shouldn't happen. Um, but pure majoritarianism does have its limitations or its disadvantages. Uh, for one thing, it tends to squelch minority views. It can turn into a vehicle of oppression. Um, it can also become very self-satisfied when there's not a constant challenge to majoritarian views. It's why in some countries, and I'm speaking now from the US perspective, you don't really have pure majoritarianism, you have uh, republicanism, not Republican with the big R, but Republicanism with the little R, um, in which there is a process of sequential delegation of decision-making authority. So at the, at the bottom, you do have the ability to elect representatives, but then the representatives now take over the power to make more short-term decisions. And they in turn will often delegate some of those decisions to experts through administrative agencies and regulatory processes, through the solicitation of advice from professional societies or academies of science, which will then be adopted or not adopted by the more official uh, regulatory agencies or the legislature itself. And in these kinds of settings, the popular majoritarianism is limited to those moments at which the general population decides whom they will have representing them in this process of decision-making and policy-making. Um, it has an advantage in that it allows one to pull in expertise and then can more likely result in evidence-based policy-making. Because the real risk with pure majoritarianism in the community is that you lose track of the ability to have your policies reflect evidence, real evidence of what is going on. You know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan um, from the US, uh, former senator from the US was really quite famous once for saying that everyone is entitled to his opinion, but not to his own facts. It, it means that we have to ask, how, how should we be deciding where the community's authority ends? And how do we make the distinction between what is factual and what is the community's kind of belief system? So in gene drives, let's take a very concrete example. If a community views um, uh, pesticide, uh, pesticides as a better form of, of insect reduction than the gene drive proposal before it, what does the better mean? If it is a value judgment about the degree of uncertainty that people are willing to tolerate. Gene drives are new, pesticides are well understood, even though we understand that they have dangers. That's a value judgment. But if it's the belief that gene drives in fact are more dangerous than pesticides, is that a belief or is that now contrary to the facts, at least as we know them? And we get into kind of a circular problem of asking who gets to define the facts and who gets to decide when they are well proven enough to be accepted now as true for the purpose of policy making. Um, it's, these are the reasons why there is still such a struggle over the role of the community, whether it's the political community, or the ethnic community in the borderline of authority, even in an empowerment situation. At that point, knowing that there is this blurriness, I do think it goes back then to some of the things that Catherine was mentioning in three areas of principles. The way to develop some degree of trust on the part of a community in delegating some of its decision-making authority and policy-making authority to others, whether elected officials or regulatory agencies or professional societies, part of the way you develop that trust is by adopting certain principles that will allow the community to feel like they know what's going on. And it's here where transparency and accountability become really important. If people understand what is being developed and they know all the steps along the way in a kind of incrementalist fashion, 
it is easier to understand what's being decided and to allow oneself to relax into accepting that other people may know more about this subject and that I can simply rely on their, rely on their judgment. Um, Accountability means that if they fail to follow through on what they said they were going to do or the protections that they were going to incorporate, that the community has the ability to then not punish necessarily, although it can be punishing, but to simply retract some of the permissions that they have implicitly given to those authorities. And the stewardship principle, which uh, I know that we're going to be discussing later in more detail, um, is something where it, it again allows people to delegate by because they understand that one very important value that's shared is that there ought to be some way in which the science is used for the benefit of many in a way that is distributed well and fairly for many and that it is going to be overall a benefit and will not necessarily destroy the environment or do something else that would become a net loss um, this kind of stewardship of science which is both protective and beneficial to all um, is one other way that's important for developing trust. You know, I, I simply think that at the end of the day, our conversations about community engagement need to veer away from what has become a kind of mantra about community empowerment and focus more specifically on the precise roles you want communities to play, uh, which may not be one in which they have complete and ultimate authority in areas in which there really are factual matters at base. Um, I, I want to conclude simply by referencing something that is a kind of ongoing theme in this area that kind of is exactly at that blurry fact and value intersection. And I know that one of our other panelists, Nika de Graaf, is going to be speaking in more depth about this. And that is the natural versus unnatural distinction, because it's here, I think, where we most clearly see this conflation of factual concerns about what is precisely known and unknown about the biological effects of something or the ecological consequences of something um, versus a belief system uh, about the role of nature and the degree to which nature is either safer or better or more reflective of some fate that the planet or the humankind should, uh, should accept. And it's there that I think we are probably also facing the most uh, deeply held instinctive reactions to some of these modern genetics interactions or I I interventions. So this is the one area where I think the, the conversation with the community about what actually is behind their support or resistance for a gene drive uh, project in their area um, could really be helped to help people tease out why they think it is, for example, safer uh, to avoid this kind of gene drive, why they think that nature is naturally more protective or that what nature does is what should happen as opposed to human intervention, which is what shouldn't happen, to tease these apart and help people to identify in their own minds what it is that are their values, which absolutely should guide what happens and will guide whom they elect to represent them versus the facts in which there ought to be some ability to say facts are something that other people may know more about. Uh, I don't expect this will be universally agreed with. I think there are people who are much stronger on a more generalized engagement and empowerment view, um, but uh, I, I'm simply gonna put forth as a principle um, that evidence-based policy making is better than non-evidence-based policy making and that expertise has a legitimate role in this process. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Catherine. Thank you, Alter, and, and an amazing amount that you've left for us to unpack in a very um, short period of time. And I know that we're gonna come back to, as you said, um, some of the challenges around these principles, one being defining them and the limit the limitations of challenges. I think something you also introduced that will definitely come back is the interconnectivity um, that you spoke of between these challenge, between the principles. We had engagement, but then we had the relationship with trust and accountability and transparency and stewardship. And I would argue that some of these are much easier or easier to define um, than others. But 
maybe someone's like engagement and new at us, but that will, these will definitely be picked up in our um, next, next talk. So next I'm going to welcome um, Aaron Peters from McMaster University, who's a uh, PhD candidate with a focus on applied ethics and policy in the global health policy space and is a graduate research assistant um, at the McMaster's Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation. He also serves on McMaster's Research Ethics Board and as treasurer on the board of directors for the Canadian Bioethics Society. His research interests um, are related to questions pertaining to the ethical, social, and cultural issues surrounding and arising from innovative technologies and methodologies with the current focus on ethics and policy issues pertaining to applications of synthetic gene drive biotechnologies in mosquitoes for malaria elimination. That is a very long sentence, but there's a lot in there as well. So a warm welcome to you, and I know you're gonna pick up on some of the challenges um, with particular principles. So over to you, Aaron, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that introduction and Alta for uh, starting the conversation off with such richness. Uh, uh, both Catherine and Alta, you have laid out uh, such a, a broad swath uh, to discuss. I can't imagine we'll get through it all in two hours, but um, I, I wanted to sort of enter the conversation uh, by with focus on, on one particular principle. Uh, I thought that it might be uh, helpful to, to zero in on one that, that seemed particularly pertinent or, or, or uh, uh, was receiving a lot of focus in the gene drive space. Um, and uh, so that, that is the precautionary principle, um, which uh, if, if, uh, if, you, if you've, some would have you believe, uh, should, should end the conversation about which principles ought to govern gene drive altogether, since the precautionary principle in their eyes might, might uh, uh, place a ban or a moratorium on the, the entire endeavor. Um, so for instance, <clears throat> in its plenary vote on June 8, 2021, the European Parliament reaffirmed its precautionary stance towards the use of new genetic engineering process called gene drive in their report on the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. The parliamentarians demand that, and uh, quoting, uh, in accordance with the precautionary principle, no releases of gene, uh, genetically modified gene drive organisms should be allowed, not even for nature conservation purposes. And uh, you know, this statement uh, comes after several years of calls from hundreds of um, uh, NGOs and organizations, uh, I will say leaning very heavily from the global north, uh, who are making this call and uh, who routinely uh, make the call uh, in line with or explicitly stating that it's motivi motivated by the precautionary principle. Um, so the belief being that the precautionary principle tells us that we ought to have a moratorium on gene drive uh, research, particularly any research that would release a gene drive organism into the environment. Um, now this is, uh, uh, you might say, oh, well, that's just Europe. There's the rest of the world. Uh, maybe not everyone is uh, so enamored of the precautionary principle, but uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity and its Car Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, which governs uh, genetically modified organisms uh, in a global sense, um, uh, they're also committed to the precautionary principle. And so the precautionary principle starts having this really outsized uh, sort of weight in the conversation uh, about whether or not gene drive uh, will or can be used uh, globally. Um, <clears throat> but what, what exactly does the precautionary principle say? Um, it often gets uh, sort of thrown out there, wielded as uh, almost like a, a, a bludgeon to stop the conversation, uh, I find. Um, but and, and there are there are numerous uh, um, articulations of the precautionary principle. It's it sort of historically came uh, came about in the '70s. It was first used in Germany uh, for some some clean air uh, acts, um, and and 
since the 70s, it's been articulated a, a few times in, in, in global legislation. Um, but in, in 2005, uh, given a mandate uh, by uh, the UN uh, parties, uh, the uh, uh, UNESCO, uh, UNESCO had a, a special commission uh, assigned to sort of elucidate and, and articulate uh, the precautionary principle in greater detail. And so they issued a report in 2005 that included a working definition of the precautionary principle. And uh, it's a little lengthy, but I am going to read it to you now in, in the interest of uh, nuance. Um, so their working definition uh, from the UN, uh, which uh, it's my understanding would govern the, the Convention on Biological Diversity's understanding since it is a UN uh, subsidiary. Um, the working definition is when human activities may lead to morally unacceptable harm that is scientifically plausible but uncertain, actions shall be taken to avoid or diminish that harm. Morally unacceptable harm refers to harm to humans or the environment that is threatening to human life or health or serious and effectively irreversible, or inequitable to pre, uh, present or future generations, or imposed with, without adequate consideration of the human rights of those affected. The judgment of plausibility should be grounded in scientific analysis. Analysis should be, on, uh, should be ongoing so that chosen actions are subject to review. Uncertainty may apply to, but need not be limited to, causality or the bounds of the possible harm. Actions are interventions that are undertaken before harm occurs that seek to avoid or diminish the harm. Actions should be chosen that are proportional to the seriousness of the potential harm with consideration of their positive and negative consequences and with an assessment of the moral implications of both action and inaction. The choice of action should be the result of a, particip a participatory process. So uh, when you see the precautionary principle presented that way, uh, with that level of nuance and detail, uh, it becomes much less clear how it ought to apply to gene drive. Um, when, when you hear the word precautionary principle, the word precaution stands out and you think, oh, better safe than sorry. Uh, uh, you know, simple aphorism sort of style impact. But when you break it down, it's much less clear how it ought to be applied. Um, and in fact, there are a number of empty variables uh, inherent to, to the precautionary principle as it's laid out. Uh, it's, it's silent on the values that orient it for instance, or at least it's not clear uh, which values are being prioritized. Uh, you could say it has competing top priorities as, as Sven of Hansen has, has said in his piece on the precautionary principle. Um, it's difficult to say whether we ought to prioritize the environment or human beings and their well-being, uh, since there's a disjunctive uh, in, in, in the definition about, you know, we, we were concerned about both. Um, but what about when you have to prioritize one or the other over the other? Um, it's, it's, it's silent on how to do that. Um, I would argue that that definition uh, is substantively uh, sort of anthropocentric in its leaning. Uh, all of the bullet points that sort of clarify how it ought to be uh, uh, engaged uh, relate to human well-being. Um, and only one would, would possibly be uh, for only environmental well-being. Um, another question that it raises is uh, what risk threshold triggers it? Um, that's also sort of a value judgment. Um, there's, a, there's a, also an open question of what constitutes uh, relevant scientific evidence uh, in, 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 in uh, sorting out uh, at what level are we certain enough based on scientific evidence to proceed or not proceed? Um, and then there's a question of what action the, the precautionary principle ought to trigger. 
uh, it's, it's being presented in, in so many of these calls and petitions and, and by the, the uh, European Union uh, Parliament as though uh, a moratorium is the obvious, uh, the obvious answer, um, but that's not clear from the principle itself. Uh, perhaps it just means we ought to be more cautious and stepwise in our approach and our regulation. Um, and then there's a question of uh, what ought the precautionary principle apply to? Uh, a process, the, the process of, of, of gene drive research or to a product, in which case uh, applying it so broadly as to place a moratorium on an entire field of research seems inappropriate. Uh, and, and perhaps we ought to assess a product or, or case by case assess products uh, through the lens of the precautionary principle. So principles uh, can, can guide us, they, they can be very useful, but they, they also, uh, without a, a without making explicit the values that are guiding our use of the principle or sort of the, without orienting our use of the principle through explicit uh, values and, and having a firm understanding of the values we are prioritizing, um, we can start talking past each other uh, as we use principles uh, since one group may be filling in all of those value variables in a very different way from another. Um, but they're both using the precautionary principle. And so why is there such disagreement? Um, so that's, I'll leave it there. Uh, and I, I look forward to uh, discussing the precautionary principle and, and other principles and, 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 and with, uh, with nuance and an eye to uh, how values and our prioritization of them inform our use of the principles. Brilliant, thank you, Aaron. And great um, sentence to finish on, on the relationship between values and principles, because I'm sure some of the audience are asking, uh, is a principle a value or what is the connectivity? And I think you've also introduced lots of challenges with the precaution of principle. It's a great definition. Um, if everyone can see it's in the chat, it's a very complex definition. I think there's a lot in it to unpack. Um, and it also leads to questions about people's attitude to risk, I think, and uncertainty. And how do you bring that in when you're looking at issues of the precautionary principle? And the process and the product question, I hope we get time to come back to that, because where is it? One of the questions I ask myself with these values and something like the precautionary principle is where is it useful to us? And does it matter whether it's useful as a tool? Um, is that an instrumentalist view? Um, so looking forward to unpacking uh, the value and maybe the, I, I liked your outsized influence, whether everyone agrees, because I notice it, it is in the, in the two, two of the three documents I referenced at the beginning, don't lead at all with the precaution principle, but I think the precaution comes up in a lot of the big documents that have um, come out before. So very much looking forward to unpacking that. Without further ado, I'm gonna move on to our third uh, panelist, Abba Saxena who is an independent bioethics advisor with a special interest in global health ethics, especially the ethics of infectious disease, health systems research, healthy aging, adolescence healthcare, human challenge studies, and new technologies, which is obviously where we're talking about today. She is currently the chairperson of the Ethics Advisory Committee of Target Malaria and a consultant to the World Health Organization and the Aga Khan University Ethics Review Board. She's also a independent, an independent resource group, a member of an independent resource group for global health justice, which is clearly a principle we should be talking about in relation to gene drives. Um, she's previously worked at the World Health Organization in um, as the coordinator of the global health ethics team. So a very warm welcome to you. And also I was talking about um, guidance that uh, WHO put out recently on vector-borne disease, and I know Abba was um, involved in that, so it has a lot of involvement in this area. Over to you, Abba. Thank, thank you, Catherine, and it's a pleasure for me to be part of this excellent panel discussion, very timely, and I'm also thankful to the two speakers before me to sort of start up the discussion in ways in areas that are problematic and also the areas that are uh, 
talked about a lot in this field, in this area of work. And uh, for example, I want to also talk about uh, the fact that when Aaron, you mentioned uh, that precautionary principle is, is defined variously by various people. And I think that brings us to whether is that discussion based on facts or beliefs. And that's what Alta was talking about. You know, how do you get people to talk about facts and not about beliefs? Because a lot of people just say, oh, precautionary principle. And, you know, that's that rings uh, alarm bells. But they don't haven't gone back to the facts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little later. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, the fact that these discussions that we are having, and especially the fact that, okay, where does precautionary principle lie in the scheme of things? I think that's where an ethical analysis comes in useful, and that's a tool we ought to use much more when we are talking about the relevant issues and principles. But I want to go back to what I wanted to say much more, and that is, if we ask, you know, the basic question I ask is, why do we need principles? You know, what are they meant to achieve? And I'm going to base my talk uh, on the example of gene drive technologies for control of malaria, just because it helps us anchor some of the issues. And I feel like we cannot answer the we, why, why do we need principles unless we know who are these principles for, who are the we, why do we need principles, who's we, who's wanting the principles, and then what is it that we are trying to, or they are trying to achieve through the use of principles. Because I think that while ethical principles in general are supposed to be overarching, aspirational, and generally applicable across populations and communities, uh, but the way, and, and that's why we need the principles, but then depending upon who is at the table, they will decide which principle is more important for them or what is it that matters to them most. For example, if I mean, if you look at the whole uh, whole scenario of a gene drive development of a gene drive technology, who all are involved in that, then we are looking at the scientists who are working on the technologies, mainly who are based in the northern, more developed countries, and they might say that we need principles to guide us to develop a technology that is helpful to humankind without any or without many adverse effects on the ecology. We want to do good for humanity and these are what we would like our principles to do for us. But these, these uh, scientists in the developed world are actually working with scientists and researchers in the developing countries where these technologies are likely to be implemented. And these researchers are saying, well, actually we need principles to help us improve our standing in the in the scientific world through the use of through our collaborations and that we want principles to ensure that our contributions to the development of the technologies are acknowledged and that we have opportunities to flourish as much as our colleagues in the developed world have but then you come to the communities and participants who are going to be the at the receiving end of these technologies in these countries and they will say well we want principles that will ensure our health and well-being is being taken care of our ecology is not disturbed and that uh, it your our participation results in real health benefits for us and finally the governments may say that you know the governments in whose jurisdictions these uh, uh, technologies will be released will say well we need principles to ensure that our populations get a fair deal and access to the uh, technologies that are being developed. And then, of course, there are a whole lot of other uh, stakeholders who are involved, and each one has their own point. So whose viewpoint will count? And my, uh, my thesis is that the people who are on the table when principles are being decided, it's their viewpoints who which counts much more than the viewpoints of those who are not at the table. And that's an issue, that's a, that's a concern that we have all the time, especially at WHO we used to have, and that do we have the right people on the table? 
And I'm raising this point because so far, the principles and based on the literature that I have read, most of the discussions on principles, moral considerations, codes of conduct have been led by people in the North, by people in European and American universities and organizations. And they have uh, not involved so much the scholars and the publics or the regulators in the less developed countries. And therefore, we don't hear all the voices that we ought to be hearing in the debate. And that's, that's a gap. And I think that, that that's one of the reasons we need principles, but also principles that work for everyone and also principles that involve everyone. And then there are different principles and we talked about some of them and there are others that Catherine talked about, but one of the important principles that has not been discussed much is something called reparative justice, as is, as in there have been injustices done in the past and can gene technology be developed in a way, the process of development be such that it is, it, it, it involves the developing, it involves the countries where previous harms had been done in ways that give them empowerment and ways that make them more um, inclusive in the conversation and gives them a place where they can guide the development of these technologies and not just be at the receiving end. Uh, because it also, uh, the, the, the way that gene drive technologies are developing is that it, um, it does raise issues about, uh, not only about equity of access to the technologies once they're developed, it raises issues about financial um, uh, drain on countries where, the, uh, uh, where this um, technology will be implemented because it might be that it costs much more uh, once it is being implemented. So issue of cost, come into the fact, come into the uh, discussion. And also another issue that it brings up is the just distribution of governmental funding for genome editing compared with other investments and the opportunity costs of investing into a technology. And then do we take away from the investments that have been done in, for example, the control of malaria through vaccine trials or the control of malaria through uh, new uh, bed nets, insecticide treated bed nets. So the question of where do you invest and what is the best way of investment and what are the ethical concerns related to those sort of choices. So I think I'm going to stop here with just saying one thing that there are various ways of looking at it. Precautionary principle is one of the principles that needs to be applied, but not the only principle. There are other principles. And usually the way an ethical analysis is done is to decide everyone sits on the table, all relevant people, and then they make a decision as to which principle has priority, because obviously you cannot use all principles. And this needs to be a discussion between the people who are involved in this or affected by this technology. I'm going to stop there. There were other things I wanted to say, but I think we'll catch it up in the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Harper. And again, a lot to a lot to unpack the introduction introduction of um, additional principles, especially the rep, the one around justice and reparations. I think will be a very interesting one to pick up because it's topical in more ways than one. Um, but you've spanned, I think, opened up the decision making process in terms of transparency all the way through before decisions are making as to what types of technology are used all the way through to the implementation challenges and costs associated with them. So I think we've opened that up um, even more widely, um, introduced issues, obviously, around equity and um, opportunity costs. But, and hopefully we'll definitely come back to this who has or should have a seat at the table. Um, and I think that also comes down to this a global debate that's happening at the moment. I think Alta said this is a global approach um, and it's interesting. So it's the seat at the table at the global level, but then how do we bring in the local community uh, level interest? And this goes back to the um, issue around engagement uh, and decision-making. So we'll come back to that. 
um, but a lot more to unpack. So I'm going to move on to our fourth and uh, final speaker, which is Ninki de Graaf, who's also a PhD candidate um, from the University of Medical Center at Altric um, in the Netherlands. And she's a bioethicist examining ethical questions related to emerging technologies, again, with a specific interest in the ethics of genetic modification. She's conducted research on the ethical issues with regard to gene drives through both empirical ethical research and normative analysis, um, and also conducted a research project commissioned by the Dutch Committee on Genetic Modification, in which he disentangled the conceptual and normative dimensions of the term nature and unnaturalness um, in discussions on gen genetic modification. Over to you, please, Ninka. Yeah, many thanks uh, also to the previous speakers and to the FNIH and McMaster University for the invitation to speak on this panel. Uh, it's great to be having this conversation with you today. Um, and in my opening statement, I would like to add to the interesting reflections on that the other panelists raised by zooming out a bit uh, and having a look at why it may be considered important to pinpoint ethical uh, principles in the first place and to elucidate some pitfalls that may accompany the reliance on ethical principles alone that I think actually the previous speakers also already hinted towards. So to start, why is it important to stipulate ethical principles to guide gene drive research? I think firstly, the formulation of and alignment with ethical principles can provide a common framework of justification that can be used to guide as well as evaluate gene drive research. So ethical principles are by their nature normative. They designate some actions, outcomes, or ends as good, desirable, or permissible, and others as bad, undesirable, or impermissible. And these principles cannot be justified in terms of any partial group. They should be stipulated in a way that takes into account different involved parties, and they should, in other words, be universally applicable. And by virtue of these characteristics, the formulation of principles for gene drive research can allow different parties to get on the same page with regards to what they consider good, desirable, permissible, or vice versa, bad, undesirable, or impermissible. And once formulated, these same principles can of course also serve as some sort of moral compass. Firstly, for those involved in the gene drive sphere, to check whether the way in which their research is shaped is actually in line with these common principles. But of course, also for outsiders to hold others accountable as these principles can facilitate the recognition of research that actually doesn't meet these standards. So that's the first reason why it is important to uh, stipulate these principles. I think secondly, ethical principles also apply across nations, across disciplines and across different legislations and can in that way also be more flexible than national or even international legislation. As we have seen, various sets of ethical principles have been published in the gene drive sphere over the years. And I'll shortly go into a few of them to give you a sense of what has been discussed in them. I think the first important publication um, by P Claudia Emerson and colleagues in 2017 in Science stipulated general principles for gene drive research namely advancing quality science to promote the public good, promoting stewardship, stewardship, safety and good governance, demonstrating transparency and accountability, engaging thoughtfully with affected communities, stakeholders and publics, and fostering opportunities to strengthen capacity and education. And this was followed by a publication in 2020 by uh, Claudia Long and colleagues, that built on this publication to formulate principles for field trials with gene drive organisms, which related to fair partnership and transparency, product efficacy and safety, regulatory evaluation and risk benefit assessment, and again, public engagement and benefit sharing. And despite these different advantages of ethical principles, I believe that an exclusive focus on pinpointing ethical principles to guide gene drive research also has some pitfalls. Because by their nature, and this was also mentioned by some of the previous speakers, ethical principles are general and comprehensive norms that don't necessarily function as precise guides to action. 
And I think philosopher Stephen Toulmin outlined this quite nicely in his reflections on the Belmont Report's principles for biomedical research ethics, because he stated that it can actually be surprisingly easy to settle on general moral principles, but in fact, much harder to reach consensus on how these principles should be operationalized. So agreement on broad principles can, in other words, also obfuscate underlying disagreements or ambiguities. And to make this concrete, I'll discuss a few examples. And the first example may be the proposed principles with regards to engagements. It, it came up uh, in Alta's talk as well. So the principles for gene drive research that have been put forward, as well as the broader literature on gene drives, all take engagement with affected communities, stakeholders, and publics to be an essential principle. Despite this broad consensus, however, a challenge remains with regards to who are considered parts of these communities, stakeholders, or publics. So these concepts are often understood in different ways. And similarly, it often remains unclear what is meant with engagement. Some may understand this to mean holding some information sessions for interested community members, the unidirectional or one directional form of engagement that was mentioned earlier. Whereas others may envision an extensive deliberative process to make community guided decisions about gene drive development and deployment, which could be more bi-directional or empowering. Uh, and in an interview study with gene drive experts that colleagues and I conducted, we also observed this uh, difference between broad agreement on the importance of engagement, yet divergent views on what this should precisely con consist of. And I think a second interesting example uh, may be the principle of fair partnership and transparency that was put forward in the publication by Claudia Long et al. And I think this is a crucial commitment. Uh, I'm sure that uh, likely no one that is present today nor beyond will disagree with it, but it also raises interesting questions that, are, that um, remain unanswered, like what constitutes a, a true partnership? What makes such a partnership fair? And what concrete obligations does, does this principle give rise to? So in other words, this general principle invites a discussion on a more precise account of fair partnership in the context of gene drive field trials. And such an account could in turn help to delineate what it should mean to partner with stakeholders or to integrate their perspectives and which stakeholders this should, this should concern in the first place. And I think this is relevant in any research context yet it's particularly pressing in the context of gene drive field trials that may occur in low and middle income countries where large social and economic inequalities exist between different stakeholders involved. And as we know from the global health literature and the community engagement literature, uh, and also from our own study on experts' moral views on gene drive governance, these kinds of inequalities can also lead to power disparities that could threaten this proposed ideal or principle of fair partnership. So in my view, an account of fair partnership that pr should provide real world guidance on how to achieve fairness in the context of these and other power dynamics. And this is key to prevent it from remaining a nice principle that, that is actually tokenistic. So in summary, uh, I believe it's relevant and important to formulate ethical principles as these can firstly provide a common framework of justification that can be used to guide and evaluate gene drive research and can secondly provide a set of principles that can be applied across nations, disciplines, and legislations. And at the same time, to really live up to these promises, it's also necessary to move from these general overarching principles to concrete moral obligations that stipulate which actions should be conducted or avoided, and where, when, how, why, and by whom. So I believe by discussing and specifying ethical principles, uh, potential underlying disagreements can be brought to the fore and potentially resolved. And I hope that the discussion today can make some contribution towards that larger goal. Brilliant, thank you very much, Ninko. And, and I'm glad you addressed the question head on of the importance of ethical principles, because I'm sure some of the audience is both questioning exactly what they are, because we've teased out a long list and I think it would be helpful to also discuss in our discussion how, how you prioritize or how you balance or are there trade-offs um, 
Um, and as we've, Aaron's already pointed out, you know, in some discussions, it looks like the precautionary principles dominating, but then Abba's pointed out and Alter and Nika, you've all pointed out different principles that have value um, in their own rights. And also the complexity of the principle discussion, they are general by definition. And I think, as we've said, in some senses, global, but it's important to unpack them. I want to be able to give you all a chance to pick up on key points made by each speaker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop back to what Alta opened with, um, with some of the troubles I'm going to explain around this reliance or maybe an over-reliance or a poorly defined um, principle in the sense of engagement um, and what more is needed in engagement um, and where it sits. So I want to sort of pick up on some, give you all an opportunity to pick up on some of the issues um, Alter raised. And there was a lot there, um, in turn, including on how do you stop wiring um, reliance on the majority um, and where is, is this an unfettered power in terms of engagement and um, decision making? Where do we draw a line? How do we draw a line? And, and what does that look like in different contexts? So I want to open it up for all of you to um, pick up on some of the points in Alta's talk and then we'll go through um, on the others. But open that up for discussion. Alta, I don't know if you wanted to add anything based on, I think a lot was already up, but over to you first. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, it, it is a chance to try, try to integrate these conversations. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, I'd like to just very quickly describe an interesting uh, pair of ways in which to handle environmental protection under US law, because they really demonstrate different ways of going about the integration of community and delegation. You know, the most typical way in our system is for a top-down law that will have experts then set limits on something. The, uh, the limits on what you, on, on the effluent that you can produce and push into the river or the amount of, uh, you know, air pollution that your chimney is allowed to create or whatever. These are usually things where there's a general law. We want to protect water. We want to make sure it's safe for this, that, and the other thing. Those laws being adopted by representatives of the public and then turning to experts. We have, a, we have one law that is really interesting because it doesn't use that method at all. And it's called the National Environmental Policy Act. And it's based on the idea of transparency and accountability. Um, there's a phrase we use in the US that sunshine is the best disinfectant. Um, that the exposure of what's going on is the best way to actually control what's going on. So under NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, under NEPA, when the federal government is going to take what they call a major federal action. They're gonna build a dam on a river. They must first do an assessment of the environmental impacts, writ broadly as they define environmental impacts. And then they must publish that. And the general public is allowed to then comment. They have a period of time to comment on whether they think that assessment is both sufficient and accurate. And they can demand a more thorough kind of environmental impact statement as well. We use the courts as the mediator, in a sense, between the public and the federal authorities to determine whether or not these uh, revelations have been sufficient. But the real point of the law is that once you have to really disclose the effects of this particular dam on this river, that it will create the necessary push for political power on the part of the general public to influence their representatives to either change what's gonna happen or adapt what's gonna happen. It's a different way of thinking about how to engage the public in which you give them the information that's needed to allow them to organize if they're not happy with what their delegates in the form of the government officials are already doing. Uh, it's, so it's a different approach and it's one that I think allows for much more of this kind of value-based discussion to go forward. Abba, please Hi. go ahead. Yeah. So Alta, thanks for that example. And it's a great example, and I think it's a great way to move forward. I'm just wondering that in the global situation where uh, it's not necessarily the government of the country which is asking, has set established the rules, the rules are set by sometimes by countries other than the country where this is happening. So for example, if you want to uh, implement gene drive technologies in Ghana, 
but the global community has said that this ought to be done and this is the way you ought to do it. How does it interplay with the legislation in Ghana with the way that the policymakers think in Ghana? And so that creates an additional, uh, let's say an additional uh, interesting um, situation. And one of the things that when we are de dealing with such a situation is how do you in how do you incorporate the cultural values in that country into the law that or how do you while while trying to implement something that is a requirement through global regulations or through global legal processes how do you incorporate cultural values and cultural beliefs such that they do not they, they're not acting against each other people are not saying oh, this is the global north again telling us what to do and stuff like that. And that's where the community engagement becomes extremely important, but also in a way that it's again, it should be bi-directional and it should be empowering, etc. But the other big thing I have about community engagement, and that's a little bit going off from what you said, but still relevant is the most problem, pro problematic thing I think I have found when we're doing, when we're talking about and actually reviewing community engagement practices in the countries that we are, we are working in is this issue about how do you include minorities in the conversation while respecting the cultural values of that country where minorities are normally not given a voice and where it's the majority which counts and say, oh, this is the way we always make decisions. And we are saying, well, no, that may be so, but you are again excluded. You know, you're not, you're not uh, respecting justice issues and they need to be heard because maybe they're the ones who are the most affected by all this. So I'll just leave it here with these two points. One is how do you get global regulations being implemented at local levels and how do you how do you manage that process and then how do you get minorities voices and i think that's where we need the principles but also how do you implement those principles that's a difficult part so i'll leave it here. thank you aaron ninka did you want to come in on these two very challenging questions and i think ever one relates to your who has a set seat at the table when some of these global instruments mm -hmm are being made and how prescriptive some of these global instruments are or should be. So are, is what's being defined at the global level principle-based legal instruments based on principles that could be widely accepted but implemented um, with different processes and challenges locally? But I think it does relate back to your question about who's defining these. Mm -hmm. and, and there's definitely an issue between that connectivity between global, regional and local um, and where are we making the decisions and how are they made. But I want to see if Aaron and Ninka want to come in on, on your two challenging questions. I, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, uh, Abba's question to me highlights the importance of I don't I don't know if if having uh, uh, an explicit prioritization of which principles you will you know when when principles butt heads when when uh, say the the principle of uh, uh, equity or, or principles of equity and 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 inclusion come up against, for instance, uh, sort of like anti-imperialist or anti-colonialist uh, principles, which, which say that, you know, if, if, uh, if, an, if a Global North Research Institute is uh, conducting research in, say, Ghana, as Abba suggested, and uh, there are decision-making decision -making processes uh, in Ghana that conflict with the principles, say, of equity and inclusion, that uh, the, the ethics that guide the Global North Research Institute uh, are bringing into that space, it's unclear, you know, which principles ought to be prioritized. Um, 
And I'm not suggesting I have any answer to that question, uh, but it's important that we bring that, that challenge into uh, stark relief and perhaps have a discussion about the fact uh, between maybe the research uh, institute and the, 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 the community in which the research is being conducted, uh, maybe that should be an, an active discussion uh, between the two groups. Uh, hey, uh, we are having, we're finding it challenging to uh, adhere to our ethical principles uh, given the uh, decision-making processes that uh, you traditionally follow. Um, can we have a discussion about how we might find a compromise or, 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 or find a way forward that, that uh, uh, meets your, your cultural and ethical uh, values while uh, making us feel that we are also meeting our cultural and ethical values. Mm -hmm. and, and there may need to be uh, a, a changing or, or massaging of the, the, the existent principles that may have sort of become rigid with tradition uh, to find a new way forward together. Um, and I expect that, that would look different in, in every situation and context. Brilliant. Thanks, Aaron. I, I'm sure there's a role for the ethical analysis that Abba raised in, in trying to deal with this as well. Ninka, did you want to come in? Because I think your point's related to the articulating the ethical principles more um, and the, univer the gap between the universal approach and the local is relevant here. Did you want to come in on either points? Yeah, this is, it's great that we're discussing this. I think this is one of the central uh, issues actually that hasn't actually been that discussed all that much in the gene drive sphere, at least not in the literature. Um, so I'm really keen that we're discussing this. And I think that the previous speakers brought up excellent points. Um, with regards to what Aaron said, I think to some extent, actually the um, concrete differences between, for instance, uh, the, the risks that are taken along in an assessment, uh, which Abba mentioned, but also the way in which decision-making procedures may vary from country to country, can uh, in some funny way actually benefit from this sort of uh, principalist approach or a uh, discussion about underlying values. So rather than just looking, for instance, at, okay, so decision-making is done in this way in this particular context, whereas it's actually done in this way in a, in, in, a, in a different context, can be helped by saying, so what is it that we want to achieve with a decision-making procedure? Or what kinds of values are at play in risk assessment? And um, for instance, different groups may um, attribute different value to different species or different uh, risks or different harms. And I think that's actually something that can be um, uh, by making that explicit, we can maybe first um, move back and then zoom in again on, so what does that mean for the specific form or shape that decision-making should have in this context or that risk assessment, that should the, the, the things that should be taken along in risk assessment. So that would be my two cents on how to approach these kinds of differences. Thanks, Inka. I'm going to pick up on another point that both Alta and, and Abba have raised that's part of this engagement issue, and this is who has a seat at the table um, in the development of the principles. And I wonder for gene drives, we've already seen examples of predominantly, well, the funder one and um, the other one who were a northern, I guess, researchers or stakeholders by counterpart. But maybe, Abba, to you, um, it's a challenge, uh, I think. And is it one that we're opening up in the gene drive sphere in terms of are we getting the right voices around the table um, in terms of the development of the principles? And, and what would they look like? Will they look differently? And maybe Alta can speak to this because I know she has experience of sitting on a panel developing, looking at principles with people from all over the globe. So I want to come back to this, who has a seat at the table and who should have a seat at the table in terms of um, the development of principles at the global level. Um, and how does that translate? So maybe Abba, because you raised it, we'll go to you first and we'll give uh, other panellists to think a bit of time to think about how we deal with this dilemma. Um, in terms of principles and what it actually means for gene drive research and implementation in reality. 
Uh, thanks, Catherine, and that's a difficult question, but I think um, what it looks like or what it could look like, uh, I know that in the debates in relation to the global biodiversity, the, you know, all these declarations and things at the global level, there are countries have representatives and they are allowed to talk about it. But I think here we are talking more about how are those big global decisions that are made uh, a, how vocal or how vocal are these countries allowed to be as in, um, you know, how, how empowered they feel to say what they have to say. Also, because I think they might be worried about funding that may be attached to some of these things if they are not following the, the, the trodden line, if you wish. But if you come up, you know, if you're saying, okay, how do we implement what, has, what decisions have already been taken? Um, having people from the global south on the table will mean that they are going to tell you that look for gene, let's say gene drive technologies for malaria eradication. They're going to say the risk benefit analysis isn't necessarily about the technology versus ecology. It's also the technology, the, the benefits of the technology to us who are dealing with malaria on a daily basis. What are the benefits that it's going to do? It's going to raise up our economy. It's going to raise up our children who are going to be healthy, who are able to attend. Our educational goals are going to be achieved. And hey, for us, if you we have to do a risk benefit analysis, some of the risks that you in the North think are huge, because you're only looking at it from your perspective, from our perspective, we are looking at human health versus uh, environmental health. And we are willing to give up something for the, for the near benefit versus something that might happen 100 years from now. And so I think that's how the conversation is likely to change. And, and that's an important shift. And we need to take that into consideration. I think another thing that the people by having a voice on the table are likely to say how is it that the funders are only raising strengths or, or, or improving the, uh, let's say, how are they funding only the universities in the North? Why isn't funding coming to us to develop or why, is, why aren't strength, why aren't fund, why aren't we being funded to support our capacities in ways that five years from now, we have an institution in the country that we are in or in the region that we are in, which is doing these cutting edge technologies. Why are we always dependent upon that? And hey, we want more funding in that area. So there are just two of the issues. I'm sure others will have more to say on that. Um, but if you have some further questions, I'm happy to, to explain. Expand. I think Alta's got an immediate comeback and it, and it ties again back to fair research collaborations, which I think is one of the important principles that's coming out of this work. It also ties back, I think, um, Abba, the comment you said about attitudes towards risk really interestingly ties back to Aaron's precautionary principle and what the European Union came up as their starting point, I suspect would be very different to populations in Africa applying the precautionary principle. So I'd like to pick up on those, but Alta, over to you, please. Yeah, no, and, and I, you, <laughs> those are both exactly the topics from Ava's comments that, that triggered my thoughts. You absolutely have to have people from other countries in the South or any country that's gonna be affected uh, at the table to set up your principles because there really are genuine value differences about risk tolerance, for example. And it's not only cultural, it can also be very much just a practical matter that uh, people in a particular country recognize how fragile their economic system is right now. So they'll take fewer risks of disrupting the current economy, for example. Um, or as you were suggesting, Abba, in the context, I remember from research clinical trials, that um, things that might not have been acceptable in certain countries in the North will be tolerated in the South because you have such a strong need for moving forward the health research on, for example, a locally financially and logistically manageable therapeutic intervention. Um, so for those kinds of things, you absolutely need to have the local perspective. Um, but I don't think 
that we can use gene drive community engagement or gene drive principles in any way to try and solve the problem of the internal political structures of every one of these countries where uh, distinct minorities or non-minorities even can wind up having very little power. Uh, countries in which women are not considered to be full active citizens uh, can't be democratic and I don't think we can try to use the principles somehow or the engagement somehow to alter that reality. It needs to be altered by something else and so I, I do find myself struggling how to legitimize community engagement in a setting in which not everybody is allowed to participate in some fashion in that kind of engagement. And you yourself said, Alba, that the, the minority, you know, minorities within a community becomes a problem in certain kinds of cultures. Um, and um, I, I think the last thing was, um, well, I, I'm just, gonna, I'm going to stop there. I'll stop there because I'm, uh, that, that's enough. Thank you. Aaron Oninka, did you want to come in on these points. Are you be both being too polite? Maybe Aaron, I mean, I think I think we've gone back to the precautionary principle and the risk assessment. It'd be interesting to hear your perspectives um, on this sure. reliance and whether it is an appropriate um, principle in this, this area. And I'll mm. come back to the minority views issue in a minute, I think. Sure. Uh, so the precautionary principle is is very predominant in in the European space, um, and I think through Europe it has entered into the uh, UN space in, in a powerful way. Um, and so you have uh, European political uh, uh, European political agendas entering the, the global space at the UN and the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. And, and uh, those member states are pushing for things that are sensible perhaps in their locales to be globalized. Um, perhaps not always with a sensitivity to how that might um, prevent other uh, uh, member states and, and, and locales from doing their own uh, risk analysis on whether a technology uh, would be worthwhile uh, to try in their space. Um, and I think that gene drive uh, mosquitoes for malaria elimination is, is, a, is a prime example of this, um, where Europe does not suffer from malaria. Uh, and, uh, and so the thought of uh, introducing genetically modified organisms, which would spread through the environment and, and change ecologies, uh, seems like a needless risk from, from that perspective. Uh, it, it seems somewhat myopic though, to try and impose those sensitivities and those, that, that risk analysis on the entire world and, and not for a specific product, but for an entire uh, field of research uh, and, and all the myriad products that might uh, come from that. Um, I don't think that the precautionary principle is well articulated or well, the mechanism is not well shaped to deal with risk-risk uh, scenarios. I think if you have a status quo that's acceptable, the precautionary principle helps you to protect that. Um, but if you have a status quo that's tragic, like you do in the case of malaria, where over 400,000 people die every year, most of them being children under the age of five, and over 200 million people every year are suffering from uh, malaria morbidity, uh, which creates an enormous depression on the uh, economies of these places. Uh, and then you're, you're, you're presented with a, uh, a somewhat risky untried technology, but which looks very promising um, from all of the initial scientific uh, uh, research and proof of concepts um, and, and around which a, a community of responsible research is forming um, and principles <clears throat> are being put in place um, and, and, and in which uh, the uh, communities uh, in which the research is being conducted are, are being uh, invested in and their capacity is being grown 
and, and local scientists are being involved and, and are at the forefront of, of the research. The risk analysis starts to look much less uh, clear uh, that, that, that we ought to have a global moratorium since uh, this looks like if it could save all those lives uh, and, and end this cycle of, of tragic loss and, and suffering, uh, that is a, a risk well worth taking uh, when what seems to be on the table on the other side of the, the, the ecological risk seems to be that there might be some disruption that is possible, but a uh, 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 catastrophic risk doesn't really seem to be uh, on, on the table. Uh, no, no scientists are, uh, foresee that. Um, All this to say that the precautionary principle, uh, it works differently at the different levels that you might want to apply it. And if you want to apply it globally in a way that would prevent uh, a more local assessment, that seems inappropriate and unjust and reckless to me. You've definitely triggered something because I've got Nink Ninka in the Q and Abba. Ninka, please go ahead. Yeah, I think um, these reflections also invite interesting discussions on two other principles that are often invoked when we discuss harms, uh, which are the principle of proportionality and the principle of principle of subsidiarity. So very shortly, proportionality, proportionality means that potential benefits should be balanced against potential harms or risks. Um, and in the context of gene drives, that means that we should, if you argue either in favor or against uh, particular applications of gene drives, you have to make explicit what you think the benefits, harms, or risks are and argue why either the harms outweigh the benefits or the benefits outweigh the harms. And I think in this way, some of these differences of viewpoints could also be made more explicit because it, there can be a tendency to just look at benefits or just look at harms and present things in a, in a one direction, one uh, very specific perspective um, that doesn't do justice to, for instance, the fact that has been mentioned that um, if you live in a country where malaria is rampant, uh, the, the risk benefit trade off is very different from when you live in the Netherlands, for instance. So I think that that helps to actually uh, bring this into discussion more. Um, and I think the other point uh, regarding the principle of subsidiarity is, is related. Um, and the principle of subsidiarity says that a policy should only be adopted if there is no less harmful policy that would achieve the same result. Um, so this principle suggests that applications of gene drive should be compared to alternative policies in terms of both their potential harms and benefits, uh, including the harms and benefits of the status quo, um, which uh, are of course essential also in the context of malaria. And I think that then it again raises an interesting question about what alternatives should be taken along and that's something we might discuss, but um, I think these two principles can, um, can be of interest as well in the gene drive sphere. Thanks, Nick. Abba. So, thanks. Uh, a point that I wanted to raise was uh, when we talk about all these, you know, which principle is important, what risks are, should be taken, ought to be taken, who takes those risks, etc. I think it's also important for, from a perceptual point of view, you know, from what does, what does the world perceive as how things are happening? And what we do want is at the local or the regional level, much more influence of so-called either regional partners or independent neutral partners. So far, the field that I have seen and what I have read, uh, a lot of it is led, even the discussions that are taking place in the countries are led by funders in the South and or funders that are heavily invested in the development of the technology and institutions that are heavily invested in the development of this technology, which means that there are questions as to are they really the right people to do, for example, to support the risk assessments, to support the discussions at the local and regional level. And here actually, Catherine, I'm going to challenge you. And I think from my perspective, uh, the WHO should take a greater role in these discussions. Uh, it is seen as a neutral, trusted partner. It is seen to be, you know, 
uh, uh, not to be fav in fact, if, if at all favoring the, the southern countries. And I think that's some, that role is missing right now. That discussion is missing right now at the level that we are talking about. Uh, but I, I welcome the challenge. Oh, Oops. I welcome the challenge. If it's not children interfering, I might invite someone else to speak while I sort the issue out in the background. Okay, I think my uh, dog issues are, being <laughs> are under control. Great timing. So I, I welcome the challenge in the sense that I do think you're right. I think these, one of the issues with the research model is that it is um, the funding base of the research model is that the engagement is included with, within that research context. It's included within the funding. And even the model itself isn't correct in the sense that sometimes the engagement should come before the scientific proposal. So I definitely agree that there's a role for neutral bodies to have these types of discussions. And I would agree a organization, especially in the health sphere like WHO should be doing it. And I think it is starting to do more of it. And we did this, I would argue, a piece of work similar to what should be done with gene drives with human genome editing. And Alta can speak to that, I think, a bit. Um, and what one and part of that work was to develop principles through conversations with many stakeholders and different parties, and then to articulate those principles throughout a governance framework, you know, embed them. What does transparency look like in human genome editing? Well, it looks like having a registry. It looks like having these kind of discussions. So I totally agree. I do think there's a stronger role for organizations like WHO um, to play. I also think this comes to the issue of responsibility and accountability. It's not just WHO. I do, I would argue, having worked for a research funder in the past, they have a responsibility and there's limitations to their responsibility. Communities have a responsibility. Um, and, and that all translates, I think, back into us defining where this responsibility and accountability is. I also want to ask the panelists about the limitations of principles, because in some ways we're talking as if principles are the panacea, but they have limitations and there are underlying systemic issues I think we're also talking about here that I find really interesting in these types of technologies. I think um, the principles are critical for these conversations and we can get some sort of consensus on some of the major principles and how to use them through processes of decision making. Um, but there are lots of systemic issues that we are raising at the same time that for these technologies to be equitably um, embedded need to be addressed. Um, and they are beyond the, the remit and rollout of principles, but we really need to think about them. And, they, and that comes back to minority decision making. Some people are being left out of the decision making. What should we do to include them? That's not unique to gene drives. That's a bigger systemic challenge. But um, I'll try to see your hand up and then Aaron, and I'll take it in that in order and try sort my dog out in the interim. <laughs> Actually, I think it's a very it's a very modern phenomenon in which we all meet each other's pets and children. Um, I, I wanted to respond directly to your comment about the, the WHO uh, committee and some of the lessons learned from that experience. Uh, this is the genome editing committee uh, that uh, Catherine was leading along with the co-chairs um, uh, Edwin Cameron from uh, South Africa and Petty Hamburg from the US. Um, so this is not gene drive, it's medical, but I think some of the lessons are worth um, going through. In the area of genome editing therapies, right now there's a lot of work going on and some very successful work going on for the treatment of sickle cell disease. But it requires a very expensive and logistically complicated uh, intervention that involves removing cells from the body, editing the cells outside the body, returning them to the body. It involves bone marrow transplant. Uh, it you know, causes immunocompromise at certain points. It's, it's altogether a barely realistic possibility for North America. And it's a wholly unrealistic possibility for West Africa where the disease is most prevalent. Um, the WHO panel, had a lot of representation from non-Northern Hemisphere countries. 
And that absolutely affected the conversation around the table when it came to questions about usability and even within um, uh, you know, a lower income country, usability for the whole population versus only portion of the population. It also made a difference in whom we invited to speak to us. And so there was a lot of testimony from indigenous groups from around the world, as well as from people from around the world that might not ordinarily be testifying in front of expert committees. One of the results was that if you look at the principles that were outlined uh, that Catherine was just referencing, you'll notice that there's a fair amount of, of emphasis on issues around access and justice and social justice versus health justice. Um, this is an emphasis that I'm embarrassed to say uh, was not as strong in our report out of the US National Academies that I co-chaired on genome editing. We acknowledged justice, but we did not give it the same level of attention. Um, nor did we do what the panel at WHO did, which was then take it and ask, what would that mean in terms of concrete policy? Going back to Nikki's point about how you have to get down to something you know, uh, less general so that you look at the recommendations and they include things like addressing intellectual property limitations that slow the diffusion of the technology, uh, about the uh, creation of a stream of research funding and activity that would support the development of alternative ways to deliver this therapy that would be more realistic in a wider variety of environments. Um, and that in turn is now having its effect as we organize the third international summit on genome editing, which comes up in March in London, in which the preliminary program is still being developed now has multiple sessions that focus on access and justice. Again, not that it was completely ignored in the previous two summits, but it never got the kind of attention it did. So um, I do think that it's possible just by having a broader representation at the earlier stages of a conversation to have something that flows through in a very concrete way a variety of activities down the road. Thanks, Alter. I've got Aaron, Aaron next. Yeah, I wanted to respond to your question about our thoughts on the limits of principles. Um, so uh, my, my, my understanding uh, of principles is that they are meant, uh, they're meant to help us get at values, they're sort of rules or or procedures or mechanisms uh, that that allow us to uh, achieve or uh, realize the values that we're after. Um, and I think that sometimes we so they're tools. Principles are, are sort of discursive tools, um, and I think that we sometimes get overly uh, accustomed to or uh, uh, comfortable with a particular formulation of a particular principle. So we, we've got our favorite tool and maybe we want to apply it in more context than it's actually apt for. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the old aphorism, once you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and, and so if you, if you're not careful about context, and, uh, and I think there's a tension here between principles which can be rigid and, and all the variety of contexts that they sometimes are applied to. Um, I think if we're finding that our principles are, are ill fit to the task or, or there's, there's a lot of pushback against uh, their, their use, um, then we have to sort of get down below the principle and look at what values we're after and be explicit about what values we're after. And it may be the case that we agree on the values, but we disagree about the principle uh, or, or the sort of the, the rules by which we will play the game to get at those values. Um, but, if, but if we can make explicit the values that we're after and start the discussion there, uh, particularly uh, if you have multiple groups who are disagreeing about how we ought to get there, if we can first find common ground in the values that we're after. Um, and I mean, there's, there's, there's different levels of values too. Uh, there's sort of like final values and then uh, instrumental values. And, and there's more, there's value plurality as well. And there's different prioritization of values. It doesn't, it doesn't become simple, 
Um, but it, it may help us to sort out, uh, uh, it, it may help us to sort out and articulate principles uh, for a particular context, for a particular situation um, that, that, that will help us to uh, more harmoniously and more justly uh, uh, realize the values that are shared in, by, by the people uh, who are engaged in, in that endeavor um, or affected by that endeavor. Um, and I, I think sometimes the, the distinction between principles and values gets lost and the understanding that principles are more fun, or sorry, that values, not principles, values are more fundamental um, and that principles can be discarded and reformed um, to better suit a situation. Uh, the, that reality is sometimes lost. Great, thank you, Aaron. I know, Ninka, you, you've got some thoughts on the difference between principles and values and other things. We'll come back to that. Abba, I'm going to go to you and then maybe Ninka come to you. And then I'm conscious of time, so it'd be good to take some questions um, from the chat. I think there's already one we can pick up on. Abba, please, to you. So I, I think I have a slightly different take on what Aaron just mentioned, because I, from my perspective, I don't think we should be saying, well, let's dilute a principle because we are in this country or that country. I think it's a question of, and that's what ethical analysis allows us to do. We say, well, these are all the principles we have. And there is, uh, the, there are, uh, the, these two principles are at odds against each other in this particular context. And therefore we will decide which is the principle, which are the principles that we will uh, order over the other principles. And that decision must be made, not as we go along, but at the start of the conversation. And then, but to say that, oh, we don't like this principle, let's throw it out or let's let's dilute it, that perhaps may not be completely right. I think it's a question of when equity is at uh, across or, or is, is sort of going against the principle of access or, the, or when equity is when there's a clash between equity and let's say something else, then we, for us, equity is much more important. So I think that's that's how I would think about it. Well, in the terms of gene drives, you can have social justice versus autonomy in the sense of how you consent for these types of things. That would be a yeah. classic case in which you do an ethical analysis, but you you would have two of those principles and I guess in your principles I'm going to call it basket I don't know where that's come from but Nika I'm going to come to you before I take questions if you wanted to add anything on this discussion and some final reflections before on the talking points before we move to questions from the audience. Yeah I think an interesting point to pick up on is this sort of hierarchy of, of principles or values um, which indeed you can have different views on and in, in my view um, there may be this understanding that we can actually pinpoint the exact weight of different principles and have a sort of list that we can then use to make decisions. Um, but I think, in fact, we, we don't really have a skill to determine the precise moral weight uh, of particular principles or particular values. So I would rather view this whole endeavor as a process of uh, inter interpreting, analyzing, assessing um, like which arguments are at play, which values or principles are at play, and then also making arguments in favor or against uh, having one of these principles um, win in a certain trade-off. And I think that's that's actually the, the importance of an ethical analysis is disentangling how you make these trade-offs and then going into discussion with others that may, may have different views to actually come to some sort of consensus on um, how to uh, have these different principles be action guiding. So uh, I'm not sure to what extent that's a different view, but I, I think it's important to um, make sure that we don't look at it like a list that we can just apply and then we're done. Uh, it's rather also a tool to facilitate discussion on why mm -hmm. would this principle in this particular context, um, why should it be uh, the central principle or the, the why should a trade-off be made in this way and not in that way? Um, so, yeah, I think we can discuss much more, but there's also interesting questions, I think, from the audience, so we might get to those first. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's an incredibly helpful articulation that in some senses, principles are tools to help facilitate discussion um, and that they do need to be, um, there's an ethical analysis that needs to be applied, but also an embedding that needs to be applied and articulated. Um, so I've got two questions today. One I think we've partially covered, and that was one, the question around, shouldn't we be troubled by principles put in place by a specific class in the global north about activities in the global south? And I think we started to address that one, but we can put that one on the table as well. And then the other one we've got is um, one about, what can we learn from other fields? Are there principles from other innovative technology areas that are relevant that we could learn from? Um, what lessons can we learn from the establishment of principles in other areas? Or do we think there's some kind of gene drive exceptionalism going on here? So I'll open that up for discussion. <laughs> I think we've already started one example, but Alta, I see you've switched yeah. your mind. Please. I mean, I'll, I'll take a, a quick stab at it. And that is something that relates to what Aaron's been speaking about with the precautionary principle. And that is um, for a variety of emerging technologies, it is an aspect of the fact that they are new and emerging that the uncertainties are gonna be somewhat greater, that the science will be developing alongside the applications in a kind of tandem process and that therefore one principle of policymaking, it's not necessarily a moral principle, but of policymaking is the um, development of a system that is both iterative and protective. That is, you can take more chances when you have more ways to mitigate any downsides that emerge that were unexpected or that were greater than expected. It's why, for example, the Safe Genes Program uh, that the US uh, Department of Defense has created uh, in the context of gene drives, among other things, is um, developing a series of tools in which you can reverse or slow or stop a gene drive. That allows you to take more risks with starting a gene drive, but it needs this kind of iterative process. And I think that that is something that is generalizable, not to all technology, but to emerging technologies in particular. And Alta, very interesting you started that in some senses. You said it may not be a moral principle, it's a policy principle, but in some senses, I would challenge that in the sense that a moral principle should translate into a policy principle. And that's where the value, that's where the real value of principles sit. Um, we just need to take that complex step between one, establishing them. And I think we've already articulated that there's problems even with the establishment. We need to have many voices at the table, one to get the establishment of the principles, the consensus on some of the principles. I don't think you ever get complete consensus on all the principles. But first, you need that step. Then you need that sort of translation step, I think, once you've got the principles. What, what do they look like in a policy implementation setting? And what are the steps and the questions we need to ask ourselves to get, to get there? And I wonder if that does, that's the bit of the process which starts maybe not the questions you ask, but the answers you get may be different depending on the setting you're in. And that's okay. Um, that's okay. I mean, where it gets problematic and I think challenging for gene drives is as we've all discussed, it's cross-border. Um, the implications, you can't separate out one community or one group in the implementation challenge. Um, but I think we've sort of helped to articulate where principles can have a value. Um, do other people want to pick up on the questions from um, the two, uh, two um, people in the audience about one, um, this issue about who has a seat at the table, and the second about is there an exceptionalism, um, especially Aaron and Nika, given you're doing your PhDs and your um, these around this topic, do you think there's some sort of um, gene drive exceptionalism going on here. Um, there's an over-focus, we're obsessed with principles, it's not actually helping the discussion. Yeah, I'd be happy to comment, uh, actually on both uh, points raised. So first, shortly, the one on, on uh, who's putting in place these principles, I totally agree. And I do think that it has been mentioned also in this panel that uh, the fact that these are put in place by uh, scientists or academics, mostly from the global north, is something that should trouble us and also something that is actually acknowledged in these principles. I think uh, the science publications mentioned that there's a, a predominance of uh, authors of the global north 
And I, I hope and think that this will be taken along in, in subsequent uh, endeavors in this regard, uh, and that should be taken along. Um, so that to that, and with regards to Delphine's question, I think that's a very interesting question. Is there some sort of gene drive exceptionalism? Should there be? Um, so I, that raises the question, to what extent are gene drives anomalies or exceptions? And to what extent do they actually require different mechanisms from other types of emerging technologies or other interventions in the public sphere? Um, and it also raises the questions, are the uh, the, the governance mechanisms that we have in place for these kinds of emerging technologies more generally, or uh, public health interventions or environmental interventions more generally adequate. Um, so I think both are important to actually answer this question. And we first need to pinpoint to what extent uh, gene drives are or are not anomalies. I think to some extent they are not. Uh, they have uh, certain uncertainties uh, that may be different from example uh, insecticides because we've been using them for for much longer but other emerging technologies also have share these kinds of uncertainties um, one thing that may differentiate gene drives from other for instance genomic uh, technologies is that they're designed to spread but which i think does actually make them different from let's say crispr based um, genetic modification technology. So that I think that might be relevant uh, also for a governance context, of course. Um, the same goes for if you compare gene drives to uh, other interventions like building a dam that could also have cross boundary effects, um, not only in the country where the dam is placed, but also uh, um, in other places where the water that actually goes through that dam uh, goes to. So um, I guess, uh, this raises many new questions, but uh, it's important to distinguish these two uh, underlying questions with regards to to what extent are they different, but also are the policies we have in place for these kinds of um, um, interventions adequate? Uh, and of course, we shouldn't get to a situation where we only stipulate certain um, governance requirements for gene drives that we do not put in place for other kinds of technologies that share similar um, uncertainty or uh, or um, um, yeah facets. So uh, I think that's very important to uh, to keep in mind also in the future and to keep on discussing. I think you raised a great challenge. I think in the governance issue of these types of technology, if we do exceptionalize them, and I'm not making a case for that on any, we run the risk of them coming into conflict with other emerging technologies. Um, so I think when we're developing, if we believe in the development of principles for gene drives, we cannot do them in isolation. I think there is a convergence of technologies, whether it be, you can imagine in some sense, AI may be used in this space. So if you have different principles and different governance mechanisms, I think you've articulated very well one of the challenges we have to have with these types of discussions. It's important to have it in the realm of gene drives, but we can't have it in isolation. And I think that to me is a really tricky one. What are the principles that are, are there principles unique to gene drives or are there principles that we need for emerging technology more generally? And where do you draw that line? Because your dam analogy is a, also an appropriate one. Um, but it's, it, you know, fields of uncertainty, I think, is a commonality here. I've got Aaron and I've got Abba. Please, Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, um, I I will echo uh, uh, Ninka's uh, response to uh, Lori Zolas' question about whether we should be concerned that uh, the, the, the global north is imposing principles uh, globally that uh, everyone else should just uh, follow. I think that that is problematic. I think, I think some of them were put in place many years ago and they should be uh, reassessed uh, with everyone. Um, uh, as to the question of exceptionalism, um, Anyone who's interested in that issue should definitely uh, come back next month because that's what the, the theme of the entire panel is next month. Um, but I, uh, I agreed with everything I think I had to say there. I, I would just add that I think, I think the intuition that there's something exceptional about gene drive is, is linked up with the, the intuitions and fears uh, that people have around genetic engineering generally. Um, 
uh, the, this question of natural versus synthetic, uh, which was discussed, I'll, to, I'll do another shout out in the very first session of this uh, panel series, which you can find on uh, YouTube, on the Gene Convene YouTube website. Um, uh, it, it seems to raise people's hackles. Uh, there, there's, there's something sort of deep and I find unexamined a lot of the time in people's responses to genetic engineering uh, in general. Uh, they seem to see it as uh, morally or ethically exceptional uh, uh, from other engineering that we do um, uh, and other interventions that we make on, on our uh, on our environments, on ourselves. Um, and, and I think that that is a discussion that needs to be had more uh, in society, uh, in ethics circles. Um, I think that there's a lot of fuzzy intuition that needs to be brought into relief and we need to enhance the resolution on our understandings of these concepts. Um, because I think that it would help us sort out uh, what we are and we are not comfortable uh, doing uh, based on a better understanding of, of what it is we're doing. Um, and so I, I just want to uh, make that broad suggestion to, uh, to everyone here and, 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 and to the audience and whoever happens to watch this after the fact. I think that examining our, uh, our understanding and our feelings, our, our intuitions about uh, synthetic and natural, and, and, and I'm, <laughs> I know Ninka would probably have a lot to say about this too, uh, but I know Abba is next. <laughs> uh, but I just think it's really important. And I think that it gets uh, glossed over in, in the discussions about uh, what is really motivating people's fears. Uh, of these technologies. Add that very nicely into, I think, some of the alt opening comments by Alter in relation to beliefs and intuition and drawing this line between evidence and beliefs and values, and it's very complex. And in the eight minutes left, I don't think we'll get to delve into it. But also <laughs> conscious that we didn't even get to start discussing some of the issues with, with the principles and this divide that's going on between, the, if you start from an environmental viewpoint, versus when you start from a health viewpoint, which I think is a huge issue in gene drives. But I've got Abba, and I, then I wanna give all panel members um, a chance for a quick final reflection, and then I will hand um, back over to Rafiq. Abba, please, to you. So I actually uh, agree a lot with what Aaron was just mentioning. And the thing is, as a scientist, and as a person who know, who's working in the area of ethics, I. I feel like, yes, it should not be an exceptionalism, but that's not what's the majority view. And I think we need to heed that view. We need to take that into our consideration and make efforts to explain the technology much more to the public, to the, to the world, and 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 that needs a lot more effort it's not for me to say oh it's not an exceptionalism or it is i think it's not for me to say that it is for people to understand that as well and that will be hugely uh, useful but also that having said that i would say that we should treat all new technologies in a similar way in the sense that do a risk analysis understand what the issues are and when the risks analysis, what is it that you can, how can you decrease the, minimize the risk? Is it worth taking the risk, et cetera? So there is the process of doing risk analysis, which should be done for this technology as well as for any other, but we cannot discount the prevalent discomfort with this technology. And that needs to be taken into account. And I just very briefly want to talk about this issue about imposing our principles on the world or imposing the principles of the North on everyone else, not necessarily in relation to new technologies, but to a very basic research ethics field where for the longest time ever, the four principles, and they still exist, autonomy as in informed consent from the person who's affected has infused the field with this very 
thing about an informed consent from the research participant and nobody else. And not hearing the African and the Asian voices who are saying, well, autonomy is important, but for us it's a family. It's the autonomy of the of the not necessarily only of the individual, but of the family, of the people around them, and how do we take that into consideration? And that's being included in the field, the discussions now. But they were not for a long time, and there was a problem in that. So I think we need to learn from the past and to see how can we improve on this sort of cultural values that are different in different countries. Thanks, Abba. Alta, any final comments, reflections from yourself? You've got one minute. Um, I, I guess the last thing I would want to comment on was the point that you were making, Catherine, about the difference between starting from a health perspective and an environmental perspective. There's one thing that I think might help, and that's going back to more of an integrated notion that human health and environmental health or the stability and health of the ecosystem are not different things. Our human health depends upon the quality of the environment in which we exist as, and the environment um, is affected by what we do in it. So I don't think we should see them as op opposing one another so much as um, each propping the other one up. Thanks, Elta. Aaron, any final comments, reflections from yourself? Um, I, I suppose I'll just build on what Alta just said and, and say that absolutely uh, the, the environment, we, we, we humans and our health, our well being depends on a, a healthy and, and stable environment. Um, but there may sometimes be trade-offs between uh, human well-being and, and uh, aspects of our environment, which may be more or less uh, important. Um, gene drive mosquitoes uh, are one of these instances where we have to decide, uh, you know, say we use a, a, a population suppression mosquito, uh, are, we will, are we willing to risk uh, uh, eliminating a particular species of mosquito, there are over 3,500 of them, um, from uh, a specific environment uh, for enormous gains in human well being and flourishing? Um, that's an open question still. Uh, but I, I think that to, to, there's sometimes the presumption made that uh, the way the natural world is, uh, is, is best. Uh, uh, or even that it's stable. I mean, something to remember is that uh, the majority of species that have ever existed are extinct. Um, so it's not the case that nature is a, a steady state. Um, so there is no sort of steady state of nature to preserve either. Uh, finding some sort of harmony with nature and, and the natural world and finding a balance that supports human flourishing, no doubt that's, that's of vital importance. But the degree to which uh, we, we, we restrain ourselves from uh, 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 making interventions on nature, I think that's an open question. And I, I don't see, uh, I'm, I'm not a non -interven One for which we need principles. <laughs> the one for which we need principles, I think. We one for which conclusion. we need principles, yes. Thanks for helping me get to the finish line, Catherine. Ninka, over to you. Final, final word before I hand back to Rafik. Yeah, no, I thought this was a great discussion and I think it sort of illustrates that to some extent moral principles might be seen as the start of a discussion. Um, and that um, same goes for, for values. Uh, I think the, the issue of naturalness has come up a few times and I think that's also a prime example of, of something that should be discussed in more detail and, and underlying values should be exposed. Alta already uh, related to that in her introduction talk that when people talk of naturalness or, or nature, uh, it's often not the case that they actually mean that naturalness as such is good, but they have certain um, values that are implicit in these kinds of statements. So they, for instance, are concerned about safety or about the intrinsic value of the, of the entities that are being modified, 
or they have concerns about how we treat the earth or nature in general. Uh, and I think we should also focus on these underlying concerns and, and, and that's sometimes missing in the naturalness discussion. But I, I hope today that we've uh, brought some of these issues to the fore and uh, I look forward to the next panel, which will uh, discuss the issue of exceptionalism in more uh, detail. Brilliant. Thank you all. And I'll finish there because we've run out of time, but a great, lively discussion. Over to you, Rafik. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipper. And thank you for facilitating today's session. My goodness, what a compelling discussion. Various perspectives, which I'm certain has left us all with a lot to consider. I honestly wish we had some more time. I um, also want to thank our panelists, uh, Alta, Nenke, Aaron, and Abba, for generously sharing their time, views, and opinions. And lastly, I'd like to thank all our attendees for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us today. Uh, so the next session, uh, which unfortunately will be the last one for this series, uh, is titled, Does Gene Drive Technology Raise Exceptional Ethical Issues? Now, this session is scheduled for, uh, for next month, um, again, at the <clears throat> same time next month, um, and will be moderated by none other than uh, Dr. Claudia Emerson who is the founding director of the Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation at McMaster University. And believe me, you do not want to miss that session. Uh, and before we close off for today, I'd encourage everyone here to share these webinars uh, with your colleagues and friends uh, so we can continue to have an engaged uh, conversation on the unsettled ethical issues in gene drive research. And we look forward to seeing you all next month. And until then, we wish you all the best. Thank you and be well. Thanks everyone.